and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the news and top-selling games from November 1986. Matt Dolphin reviews the Vidi ZX. I play some older games, take a look at a newer title. Jeff gives us another hidden gem. Jason continues his berserk development, and I look at some serious software. But first, it's the news. The troubled software house Beyond has been bought by Telecomsoft and joins other acquisitions Odin in the mid-range camp. Along with Firebird, each team will still produce games under their own label, and we may even get to see the now infamous Star Trek game completed and released. Last month, we heard of the case about two games that were very similar. Too similar to be coincidence. Crime Busters by IJK seemed to be a rip-off of Spellbound, with just a few graphic changes. However, IJK now claim that it was the fault of the game's author, Dave Jones. They claim he sent games to both companies, hoping to cash in. Now IJK have recalled all of their games and are destroying them. They are also making a point of warning other software houses to be careful of the author. And as for the other similar title by IJK, Quest for Freedom, well, this is still in dispute. It seems odd that IJK have two of these titles and blames the author. And as most Spectrum fans know, IJK, better known as Harry Price, continued with this trend of selling modified games. Last month, Mastertronic were upset that they had seemingly dropped out of the charts following Gallup's decision to bring in WH Smith sales into the calculations. WH Smith did not sell Mastertronic games, and this led to the charts being skewed. Happily, however, WH Smith have now agreed to stock their titles, meaning it won't be long before their games are back in the charts again. With Amstrad taking over the Sinclair brand, Sir Clive has had somewhat of a back seat recently, but now he's back. He has set up two companies that he hopes will be involved in the future of the computing industry. Animatic will be working on one of Clive's long-standing projects, the Wafer Scale Technology. And Modulizer, the second company, will be working on the Pandora, the much-mentioned but never seen portable computer. According to the company, the Pandora will now not be Spectrum compatible, but instead will run CPM and will launch next February. Boots have stopped selling the Spectrum Plus 2 due to reliability problems. The company has checked the first batches of the machines and found them to be, in their own words, unacceptable. They have sent a memo around to all branches, informing them that due to reliability issues, they will no longer be stocking them until the matter is resolved. Further batches seem to be okay though, so maybe it was just the original shipment being rushed out. Amstrad seem unaware of the problems though, and they deny there are any issues. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. Coming into the chat this month are Paperboy, the arcade conversion from Elite, Light Force, the impressive looking shooter from FTL, Dan Dare, the colourful platform game from Virgin, Starquake, another excellent platformer from Bubblebus, and Trivial Pursuit, the board game from Demarque. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from November 1986. If you owned a computer in the 1980s, then you might just remember the excitement of seeing digitised graphics in games. As software houses strove to make the games more exciting, even the loading pictures occasionally featured images which had been scanned and then transferred into the memory of the humble specky. Often these were seen as a way of creating the wow factor. Despite the low resolution, some memorable results were achieved. Games such as Amorote used digitised images to enhance the experience, providing extra value for 1 to 8K owners hungry for a reason to impress their 48K friends. The infamous Samantha Fox Strip Poker took a different approach, marketing the entire game on the strength of the now very primitive digitised images. The software house Beyond also used it as a marketing technique, sadly though, 
the game failed to materialise despite overwhelming anticipation. But what if it were possible to create these graphics at home? Yourself. This is the Vidi ZX, a video digitizer designed especially for the ZX Spectrum. It was initially sold via mail order by Rombo Productions in West Lothian. This particular one was bought by me in 1988 and has spent most of its life since then in a dark cupboard. But in its day, it provided many hours of entertainment. These old screenshots and printouts are now a fascinating time capsule of what was on our television screens back in the late 1980s. There are plenty of memorable faces, from Harold Bishop to Clive James, from J.R. Hartley to Steve Davis, and from Paul Daniels to Jasper Carrot. Television wasn't the only video source available. These screens were taken from the output of a Commodore Amiga. The Vidi ZX was not the only product on the market. We also got the Sunset Video Digitizer for the princely sum of £128, almost as much as a new Spectrum Plus 2. This was followed by the Dataskip Video Face, which was substantially cheaper, could do frame animation, and was later marketed by Romantic Robot at a lower price. But the Vidi ZX offered animation and more, and all for an eventual price of under £30. The manual is detailed but also nicely written so that it's possible to get started right away, but there's also help for technical users who want to incorporate the machine code routine into their own programs. The interface is compatible with every model from the 48K to the Plus 3, but for the purpose of this feature I'm going to be trying it out on a Plus 2. The interface features a phono style video socket which can be connected to any analog video source and there is also a small dial on one side, but more about that in a moment. Once we're connected and powered up, it's time to load the tape and we can begin. The software is fully menu driven, allowing easy control of all functions using only the enter key and the spacebar. Pressing enter three times from the start page takes the user directly into simple frame grab mode and we're up and running. Once a video source is activated, we can sit back and watch movies in Spectrum style. The Vidi ZX displays the streaming images by setting each pixel to on or off and to the defined ink and paper colour, such as the unusual default choice of blue on yellow. An optional shade effect, which we can see here, can be used to increase the sense of light and shade. I found that this greatly improved the video quality. The small dial on the side of the interface can be adjusted in real time to find the best brightness level for the video stream. Chosen frames can be grabbed and then saved for use in your own programs, or perhaps in an art package. An impressive range of storage options are offered besides tape, including Disciple Interface, Microdrive and Plus 3 Disc. Users are encouraged to back up the main program on their chosen media. The manual explains how to amend the basic program to accommodate other printers or possibly even modern storage devices such as the Div MMC. Before running a frame grab, it's possible to change the colour scheme by selecting the appropriate number for each colour. Any combination of spectrum attributes is permitted, even border, bright and flash, though these can lead to some pretty interesting results. The final feature offers more entertainment in the form of animation. In sequence mode, up to six captured frames can be stored in memory. This can then be played forwards or backwards, at varying speeds, and even played back in a continuous loop. Sequences can be saved and used in your own programs. So in conclusion, the Vidi ZX was a fun gadget in its day, with lots of flexibility, a well thought out menu system, numerous features, and all at an unbeatable price. And maybe it's just me, but as technology marches ever upwards and the years go by, 
perhaps we'll all but forget the time when we could make magic happen on the humble Specky. But then again, maybe I'm just being too negative. This is World Class Leaderboard, released by US Gold in 1987. As far as golf games go on the spectrum, there have been some pretty miserable attempts, but for me this one has most of the features I'd like to see in a game. The box contains two cassettes loaded with four courses, and a huge instruction sheet covering each course, clubs, controls, and the intricacies of golf in general. There are three levels of play, kids, amateur and professional. The kids option has no hook, slice or wind to affect the ball, the amateur just misses out the wind, and the professional has everything. Once you load the main game, and have selected all of the options and entered your name, the first course is loaded. Each hole is stored separately on tape, so you have to step through them one at a time. Each one is drawn on screen from background to foreground, with the fairway, green, bunkers and trees all appearing as the game draws them. When you are ready to take the shot, you use left and right to move the cursor on screen to set the direction, you select the club using the up and down keys, and finally you press and hold the fire key. The power meter goes up, when it reaches the desired level you release the key, the power meter goes back down, and to complete the shot you have to hit the fire again as the meter reaches the marker. You can see the distance to the hole in yards, displayed on screen and either by using the supplied chart, or by having a good knowledge of golf, you can select which club is best suited to get the ball closer to the hole. The player moves through the swing at each stage of this process, and the end result is that your ball is sent flying off into the distance. If you're lucky, it will stay on the fairway. Once you get used to the controls, this becomes easier to judge. Once you manage to get on the green, the game switches automatically to the putter, but the mechanics for hitting the ball are more or less the same. A line on screen indicates if the green has a slope and in which direction. For me this was the hardest part of the game, getting the strength just right to get the ball near the hole was tricky. If you manage it, it's on to the next hole. Graphics wise the game looks pretty good and the player is well animated. Sound is hardly used apart from a very irritating clicking noise during play. I thought it was a fault with the emulator, but it does it on the real machine too. There's no reason for it. Overall then, not a bad game, if you have the time and patience to learn the controls, to work your way through each hole and course. There are additional features, like a putting green, and an option to select a punch shot, which add value to this already packed release. Golfers will enjoy this challenge then, but arcade fans may get bored too quickly. This is Robot Riot, released by Silversoft in 1983. This early Spectrum game was written by Patrick Richmond, who also wrote Thruster and Astronaut for software projects. You control a security officer in a robot company, and following a breach of the central operations room, you have to take control of the bomber unit to rid the corporation of this menace. Your job is to destroy all robots on each level, and to do this you have to lay bombs along the corridors. Once all corridors are covered in bombs, you have a short amount of time to get to the central room for protection before they all explode. Of course this is made harder due to the other out of control robots, each with their own special feature, not to mention a power meter that has to be kept topped up. Despite the complex plot and added mechanics, this is a reverse Pac-Man style game, where you have to lay dots instead of eating them. There are power pills, in the shape of power mites, that have to be eaten to keep the power up, which is displayed at the top of the screen. The other robots don't all kill you when you bump into them, some reduce your power, some remove any bombs you have placed already, while others just destroy the bomber unit. To be honest I just avoided them all just to be on the safe side.
the graphics are large and smooth, with a comical look, but too much on screen does cause a little bit of a slowdown now and again. There is a constant bleep sound, present in all Patrick's games, as well as general sound effects and some nice room transition routines. Control is crisp, but you can sometimes get stuck trying to move through a gap and end up being killed by one of the chasing robots. There are opening and closing doors too, and these can be used to your advantage by blocking any chasing robots as you nip in and out trying to lay more bombs. Each level has different wall graphics and a different layout, keeping things interesting, although there is a lot to keep you occupied as it is. This is a nice little game actually, easy to play once you master the controls and it easily passes 30 minutes or so. Obviously it will appeal to Pac-Man fans, but I think this stands up on its own. Go grab yourself a copy and see how far you can get. This is 4K Race Refueled, written by Paolo Ferraris in 2005. 4K Race Refueled is, as its name suggests, a racing game written in just 4K of code, and for that 4K you get a really impressive and playable game. Originally entered into a 4K coding competition, this game shows what you can do with a small amount of memory and a huge amount of talent. Don't expect tons of options though, there's no different cars or tracks, but do expect to find a great little game that's very challenging. The idea is simple, try to complete the race in a given amount of time. As each stage is complete, of which there are seven, your time is extended, like many other classics such as Outrun or Hang On. The graphics are really nice, as you can see, with the car looking great, and some good animation when it turns. The roadside objects and road in general also look good, and really puts to shame some other commercial racing titles. Sound is limited, but the engine sound is good, with changing pitch to depict speed increases and decreases. It's not an easy game, but it is great fun to pick up and play, and the author hints at an extended version, which would be excellent. You can get the game from the URL on screen, and I would certainly recommend it if you're a racing fan. Great fun! Today we're going to have a look at a more modern title which is Dominatrix. Now if you've never heard of this title and it passed you by I wouldn't be at all surprised because if you search for it on the internet then you'll find very very little information about it. World of Spectrum simply says it was released in 2005. The publisher was Chronosoft, who, as I'm sure a lot of you know, publish many, many modern Spectrum games. The author is Bob Smith, and that's pretty much it. There's not much else. There's a cassette inlay, but there aren't any instructions, and I haven't really been able to find any instructions for this game out on the internet. Now, there are instructions within the game. When you load the game up, you do actually get a few instructions, but that's about it. So one of the other things that the World of Spectrum site says about this game is that it's based on Tetris. And it is. It's very, very similar to Tetris, but instead of having strange shapes falling from the top of the screen, you get dominoes. And what you have to do is arrange these dominoes so that the number of dots on the dominoes are next to each other. And when you have the same number of tiles with the number of dots on connected, then they disappear. 
So for example, the four domino, if you have four tiles, each with four dots on it, all connected, then those disappear and you score the number of points, which is the number of dots that have disappeared. Now the single dominoes are slightly different in that the single dominoes basically disappear if a tile that they connected to disappears. So if you get four four spot tiles next to each other and they disappear and there are three one spot tiles connected to those, they all disappear. It might might sound complicated but you'll soon get the hang of it if you play this game. And if you do play this game you'll probably find like me that you end up playing it a lot. A great deal. I have had times where I've picked this up, thought I'll play for five minutes and half an hour later I'm still playing. It is one of those very, very simple, incredibly addictive games. Now, I don't think it's quite as good as Tetris. As I said, it's based on Tetris, and I've played Tetris, and Tetris is very, very addictive. But there are lots of games that are kind of based on Tetris, your columns and other games of that ilk, where you have to drop things into columns, obviously. And they are all pretty good and pretty addictive. But I think of all the variants on Tetris I've ever played, this is the one that's probably kept me occupied for longest. I just keep coming back to it. And even now, when I put it on, if I'm on a long train journey or something like that, it just seems to be an incredible time sink. The time just seems to absolutely fly whenever I play this. Now, the gameplay mechanic is quite interesting because what you find is that the smaller numbered tiles, your twos, threes, and fours, are quite easy to deal with. The ones can be a pain. Sometimes you get some ones and you don't really want them. It's like, oh, where do I put these? Especially the double ones. But the fives and six tend to be quite difficult. And of course, you'll get some dominoes that have a five and a six on. And my general tactic for them is actually to create a column of six and a com column of five right in the middle of the playing field. And then any fives or any six tile dominoes you attach to these columns. And of course, if a five and a six comes together, you just put those two columns together and you drop the five and six on top in the right orientation. Now, that's okay when the game first starts. But of course, as the game keeps going, it gets faster and faster and faster. And when it gets really, really fast, it gets really difficult. And as you make mistakes, then it gets harder and harder. And of course, that pushes the level of the dominoes up towards the top of the playing field, which gives you even less time to react to what's going on, just as you get in Tetris. Now, I don't know if there's a score multiplier in this game. So obviously, in Tetris, if you get a Tetris, if you manage to knock four lines out with one piece, then you get a huge, big, massive score. In this game, I'm not sure if there is, and because there's so little information about it on the internet, there's nothing that actually says how the scoring works. And to be honest with you, when I'm playing this game, I'm so busy trying to make sure that the dominoes fit into the right places that I don't think there is. So if there's a score multiplier, if anyone knows the rules and knows if there's a score multiplier, then please let me know. One thing I will say is that most times I get about the same score, about 2,500 points, I think, is where I generally end up when I play this game. But that might just be down to the way I'm doing it. And if there's a score multiplier, maybe you could get that in about four or five moves and some people have got much, much higher scores. So with some of the games in this series, I've said that a modern remake on, say, a tablet would be a really good idea. I don't think that's right for this game. In fact, in a strange way, I think this game is really, really suited to the Spectrum. If you think about the Spectrum and the fact that it couldn't handle colours very well, making a kind of columns-type game like this where you're using dominoes, so it doesn't really matter which what the colour is, all you've got to do is be able to see how many spots are on each tile, actually makes a lot of sense. This game really, really, really is well suited to the Spectrum and the limitations of the Spectrum. And as with all games, I would encourage you to seek it out and play it. It's a lot of fun. It's really, really simple. It really can take a lot of your time. If you've got a handheld device that can emulate the Spectrum, I'd say get it on that. So all that remains for me to say is, until next time, happy gaming. If you recall last month's instalment, Jason was not happy with the movement of Evil Otto, wanting to get the same movement pattern as the arcade. Well, this month with a bit of machine code, he's implemented a more flexible routine, with the potential to change it later, if the need arises. During this work he came across problems using the sub a, e command. His assembler refused to accept it. Digging about on the internet, he found that the sub always affects the A register, so the command is really sub e. This was accepted by the assembler, and work continues. While testing out various things in the game so far, he noticed a bug that caused the player's laser to hit something and stop, even though there was nothing there, and this happened randomly. 
Trawling through the code, it became apparent that the game thought the laser had hit one of the robots, despite one not being there. The laser code checks for a change in the attributes as it moves across the screen, and if there is a match to the colour of the robots, then it triggers a hit. After a bit of digging about, it turned out that Jason wasn't clearing the attributes after he'd moved one of the robots, so they were leaving invisible trails behind them, and this is what was triggering the hit on the laser. A quick fix, and now everything works fine. Looking ahead, and the next thing to tackle, are the robot lasers, a high score table, and revisiting the sound effects. Find out how he got on next month. For MicroDrive users, Interface 1 gave us quite a few commands to use, patched into Sinclair Basic. You could format, copy, load, merge, save, erase, use data channels, and get a listing of contents. They were pretty basic, but covered most uses, and despite the strange syntax, were easy to use. If you wanted extra functions, you had to buy something. Something like SuperDrive from Transform Limited. Inside the box is a small instruction sheet and the microdrive cartridge itself. Loading gives you a very basic menu with three options. A4 shaded copy, super drive and cat. The shaded print gives you a full shaded printout. Next is super drive which provides a set of useful tools. And finally a menu making utility confusingly called cat. But seeing as my printer is not compatible Let's move on. Let's have a look at SuperDrive, starting with Format, and if you want more space on your cartridge, the Format tool is very useful. Normally, using Sinclair's version, you'll get about 85k per cartridge, but the SuperDrive version will give you around 105k. It does this by formatting at a higher density, which is selectable, but the instructions do warn that higher densities may not always work properly, so you have to experiment. Next is the CAT tool. The Sinclair version again just displays the name of the cartridge, the files on it and how much space is left. The SuperDrive version expands on this with more details including the size and start address of any machine code files. Lastly we have the Repair tool. This will go through the sectors on the cartridge, locate any basic programs and attempt to repair the checksums. And this, hopefully, will allow them to be loaded, rather than giving file not found or an error. Once repaired, it won't actually replace the faulty code or the bad sectors, but it will allow the program to be loaded, so you can at least recover some of your code. Back to the main menu and the final tool, which is CAT, and it's different from the one in the previous set. This one allows you to build small menus for your own programs. The main problem is that your programs to be compatible, have to start with a full stop. So if you want to use this, you have to rename any of your programs on the cartridge first. Once you've done that, you can run this program, which will generate a program that will auto-run using the run command. Another limitation is that you're only allowed 25 files. Not very exciting, and something you could probably make yourself in a few minutes. SuperDrive then, Here's a collection of useful tools, but I'm not sure if they're useful enough to charge £10 for. There are similar tools free on several tape magazines and as type-ins. So to sum up, useful, but not at that price. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.